Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear. So I talked a little bit about the kind of like powerhouse horror novelist, Dean Koontz, a while back. Can't remember exactly when it was. Um, I think it was back when I reviewed what's probably like the best screen adaptation of his work, at least to date, which is uh, the massively underrated uh, 2013 movie, Odd Thomas, uh, which starred the late Anton Yelchin, uh, which is a great movie, by the way. I did a review of it a while back, um, you know, and it's really good, so check it out. I don't know. One of the weirdest things about Dean Koontz's body of work, I guess, is that he's written a shit ton of novels that sell in the millions. I mean, at least from my understanding, uh, I think that he's like the second best-selling horror novelist of all time after Stephen King, obviously. But in spite of that, like comparatively few of his books have been adapted to movies. And then when they do get adapted, they tend to be like pretty lackluster. You don't really hear much about them or they get like really poorly received and sort of like forgotten about. I'm really not sure why nobody's been able to do like a big like definitive adaptation of a Dean Koontz novel. It seems like a, a strange amount of them, too, are uh, adapted into TV movies, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad, because I've seen some really good TV movies, but it does seem very bizarre to me, like, how an author with such a presumably massive following, you would think, uh, can't really seem to merit a really good quality, like, cinema adaptation of one of his books. It seems like it hasn't really happened yet. So as a case in point, I actually wanted to talk about The Servants of Twilight, which is a 1991 made-for-TV adaptation of Dean Koontz's 1984 novel, which was actually written under a pseudonym initially, uh, Lee Nichols, and was originally just called Twilight, although as far as I could determine, the title was changed like a long time before the much more famous like Stephanie Meyer books came onto the scene. So Servants of Twilight was another one of those movies, uh, you know, again, like the mostly forgotten 1989 movie Cameron's Closet, like that I talked about a little while, like, you know, a couple weeks ago or whatever, that I seem to have seen like a few times back on cable back in the 1990s. And even though I barely remembered anything about whether it was particularly good or bad or like whether I liked it or, or not, like it's just seemed like something about it must have stuck with me to such an extent that when I was like scrolling through Tubi, I was curious enough to be like, oh yeah, I remember something about that movie, like some part of it that like stuck with me. So I decided that I was gonna rewatch it. So Servants of Twilight was actually directed by Jeffrey Obrow, Obrow, I'm not really sure you pronounce his last name. Now he actually got his start in horror with the low budget, like 1982 slasher, The Dorm That Dripped Blood. And then he went on and directed The Power in 1984, which I think I've seen a couple of times, and The Kindred in 1987, which I think I actually saw in the theater, believe it or not, uh, and saw a couple of times on uh, cable uh, subsequently. Now, Servants of Twilight was, I think, like his first television film, and it was also his last collaboration with, like, his longtime writing-directing partner, whose name is Stephen Carpenter, and Stephen Carpenter would actually go on to create the very long-running grim television series like the ones like about fairy tale type of thing uh, i think that ran from like 2011 to 2017 so that was the guy behind that there are actually like quite a few things to like about servants of twilight uh its main high point at least in my opinion is the cast which actually includes the Australian actress Belinda Bauer, who was in Flashdance, Robocop 2, like among other things. Uh, the very prolific character actor Bruce Greenwood, who I think he played uh, Pike in the, you know, the Abrams Star Trek movies. He was in Gerald's Game. He was in Doctor Sleep. So he's done some movies with Mike Flanagan. Like he's been in a million movies. Uh, Jack Kehoe, I think is how you pronounce his last name. He was in Serpico and The Sting, like a lot of those kind of like movies from the 70s. And you got two... David Lynch regulars as well. Uh, the always creepy and awesome Grace Zabriskie uh, is in this. And the big tall guy, like, uh, you know, the the guy that plays like the giant on Twin Peaks, uh, Carol Stroiken. Stroiken is, I think, how you pronounce his last name. He's Dutch. Uh, so the movie also, I have to say, like features one of the better child performances like from this era and from this type of film. Uh, the kid actor it was named uh, Jarrett Lennon. He actually comes across as like really natural and very, very sympathetic. 
Jarrett Lennon, incidentally, uh, worked pretty steadily, I guess, like as a child actor into like his teen years or so, you know, around there. And then probably pretty sensibly, like took a long break, um, you know, got a degree, went and worked in IT, uh, you know, and had like a normal life, raised a family and whatnot. And then fairly recently, like 2015, he got back into acting again and started touring with like an indie improv group, which have had some success. So I thought that was like pretty cool. Now, although I haven't read the novel that The Servants of Twilight is based on, I did actually read a very detailed synopsis of it. And from my understanding, uh, the movie, I guess, like toned down maybe some of the more like bigger, like epic aspects of the extended chase sequence that sort of like comprises the bulk of the narrative, I guess. And they probably did that for budgetary reasons, I imagine. Like some of the stuff is in there, but like some of the bigger set pieces, obviously they would have had to kind of scale that back a little bit. Also seems like it spends less time with the supposed villains of the piece. Uh, they seem to have been given more dimension in the novel, and it seemed like there were some scenes that were particularly like from the main big bad, like from her point of view, whereas you don't really get that in the movie. Like she is in the movie, but you don't really see things from her POV, like for any, uh, you know, significant amount of time. Now, the book also apparently leaves the ending ambiguous, whereas the film's ending is very explicitly defined, and that's a decision I wasn't really on board with. Now, because I would actually like to touch on the reasons I thought the movie should have stuck with the novel's more uncertain resolution, uh, this discussion going forward is going to have spoilers for both the book and the movie, so consider this your warning. You know, like I said, this was 80s and 90s, so if you don't want it spoiled, then maybe, like, go read it or watch it or whatever and then come back because I'm going to, like, pretty much say what happened at the end because I can't discuss my dissatisfaction with the way that it was adapted if I can't talk about that. So at the beginning of the movie, we're introduced to a single mom uh, named Christine and her son, Joey, who's about nine years old. I think that's about how old the actor was anyway. Uh, after a very brief period of just kind of like establishing their, you know, very normal loving relationship, you know, how normal their interactions are, picking the kid up from school, getting him ice cream, shit like that. We're kind of like pretty soon into the story. We're thrown a curveball in the form of spooky ass Grace Zabriskie. Now, she approaches the two of them, the mother and son, in, like, a mall parking garage. Now, at first, like, for the first couple of minutes, she seems, like, a little bit weird and invasive, but she isn't being too crazy initially. Um, you know, she's like, oh, what a handsome little boy and that kind of stuff. Like, talking, like, one of those kind of, like, meddlesome old biddies who don't understand personal space and always want to, like, you know, grab your baby's cheeks and shit like that. Uh, but then, she, you know, very, very, very soon into it, like, she ramps up the insanity, pretty much, like, starts screeching at Joey that she knows what he is, and telling Christine that the boy will have to die. So, you know, that's a little upsetting. Now, Christine, understandably, uh, shoves the deranged woman out the way, uh, jumps in the car, and peels the fuck out of the parking garage. Now, Joey, again, understandably, is pretty shaken by this whole experience, and he's actually convinced that the woman is a witch. And later that night, he tells his mom that that same lady was kind of like skulking around outside his bedroom window. Now, Christine doesn't believe this at first, but then the next morning, they actually find their golden retriever, Brandy, beheaded on the porch, uh, which thankfully they don't show. They just like explain it, you know what I mean? So I'm just like, well, you know, if you're going to kill the dogs, at least don't show it. So thank you very much for that. So Christine calls the cops as you would if somebody beheaded your fucking dog. So the police officer who shows up is maddeningly dismissive, <laughs> surprisingly. Uh, apparently he doesn't believe that they actually saw this woman and he really doesn't seem to give two shits about a dog being beheaded, which like I said, seems like a little threatening to me. Uh, not, you know, just aside from the fact that you're killing a, a beautiful animal, you know what I mean? Uh, basically he tells them before he leaves, why don't you just like trust in God and stop bothering the authorities with their bullshit essentially. Now there is a reason I think like for the officer acting like this, but you don't actually find out what it is until later on. And actually it didn't even really occur to me cause it was just like such a nothing scene that I forgot about it until like later on. And then I was like, oh, I guess that's why that cop was acting like that. You know what I mean? They don't state it outright, but like as the story goes on, you figure out why he was acting that way. So because Christine and Joey are now very clearly being followed by this mysterious white van that pretty much magically shows up like wherever they are, Christine, you know, knowing that she can't go to the cops because they don't give a crap, um, she's desperate. So she turns to this private investigator named Charlie. 
Now, I'm not sure if I missed it. I'm not really sure how Christine had heard of him and why she went to him specifically. Because there is a scene where she goes to the office and there's another investigator there and she's like, yeah, and the secretary's like, yeah, the, you know, she doesn't want to talk to you. She was waiting for Charlie. So I guess she heard about him somewhere or something. Like maybe he had some kind of like reputation that preceded him and that was maybe delineated more in the novel. I just didn't know like how she knew about him. But, you know, maybe that was cut for time. Who who knows? Now, regardless, uh, Charlie, who actually retired, he's still an investigator, but he retired from field work like a year before, like after the death of his wife because he had a hard time dealing with it. Um, he agrees to take Christine's case on largely because he seems to feel like really drawn to her, like in a way he can't really explain explain and he just suddenly feels this burning need to protect her and her son from this insane woman who seems to have targeted them for reasons unknown. Now somewhere around here as Charlie agrees to take their case and kind of like befriends them a little bit, Charlie ends up getting Joey another dog and it looks exactly like the first dog only this time Joey calls him Chewbacca instead of Brandy was like the first one. Uh, this second dog it, uh, you know, will be an important plot point later on. So that's kind of why they spent a little bit of time on it. So as the story continues, Charlie discovers that the insane stalker woman is named Grace Spivey. And she's supposedly some kind of weird preacher. And she's the head of this kind of loony apocalyptic cult called the Servants of Twilight, obviously, who essentially like believe that it's the end times. You know what I mean? Now, her and her minions are convinced that Joey is the Antichrist and they will stop at absolutely nothing to essentially like wipe him off the face of the earth. Now, once this fact is established, the movie becomes pretty much just like one long chase sequence as Charlie, Christine and Joey are forced to stay on the move to evade the cultists. Now, the cultists somehow always seem to be like one or two steps ahead of them. Like one time, for example, uh, some of the followers even show up at this random hotel that they stop at. And it's implied that the cultists got there before the trio did. You know what I mean? Like, how did they know that? So Charlie can't really figure out how the Twilight Nutters like always know where they're going to be. Like, especially since they're very, very careful about not telling anybody their plans. Now, early on, when Charlie actually meets with Grace briefly to see if he can reason with her, uh, spoiler alert, he can't, um, it's implied that she might be psychic and that all the other followers are able to essentially, quote unquote, feel the boy's evil. So they're like, well, the child will never be able to hide from us because we can always like sense where he's at. Later on, though, there's actually given like a more pragmatic explanation um, because it comes to light that like a mentor and associate of Charlie's who was supposedly helping them like in their escape was actually on the side of the cult and was like reporting their whereabouts to the wackos. So finally, after Charlie, Christine and Joey have, you know, repeatedly failed to elude Grace and her followers, the three of them decide, you know, they can't run anymore and they're just going to make this final stand at this remote cabin that they've been staying at that belongs to a friend of Charlie's. Now, during this last confrontation, Charlie gets like wounded, like taken out of commission and Christine is apparently killed. Now, Grace's right hand man, Kyle, who's played by Carol Stryken, like I said, the, you know, the big tall guy from the David Lynch movies. He was supposed to be the one to kill the kid. Like he was supposed to be God's hammer. You know what I mean? But he was having like crises of faith, like all through this whole thing. Like he didn't think he could do it. He's like, oh, he's just a kid. And you know, what if we're wrong and all this other kind of shit. And then, you know, Grace is always like, well, this is God testing your faith. And the kid is Satan and blah, blah, blah. And all this other, cause you have to do it. And you know, so when it comes down to it, you know, Kyle's supposed to kill the kid, but he can't do it because, you know, he has empathy. He's like, it's just a boy. It's just a boy. He's like, I can't do it. Um, and Joey looks really cute. And he's like, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. You know what I mean? So it's like that. So Grace is basically like, well, fuck. I just, you know, you keep, you have to do anything. You have to do everything yourself. Uh, so, <laughs> so she goes to like blow the kid's head off. But before she can, like a swarm of bats kind of come swooping into the cabin and kill her. And subsequently, Joey appears to bring his mother back to life 
a fact which causes Charlie to wonder if the cultists weren't actually right about the kid all along. Now, I forgot to mention this before, uh, but the movie is actually told as a sort of extended flashback. Like, Charlie is telling this whole crazy episode to a psychiatrist friend of his whose name is Dr. Booth. Now, three months have passed since the incident, and in that time, Charlie has actually become convinced that Joey actually is the Antichrist and has to be destroyed. Now, Dr. Booth obviously thinks he's lost the plot, but Charlie starts laying out all the evidence, uh, including, like, the bat swarm that killed Grace, the supposed resurrection of Christine. He's like, you know, I saw she was dead, blah, blah, blah. And the fact that Joey's father was just some random dude that Christine met on a cruise whose name she didn't even know. He then tells Dr. Booth that he's even certain that the second dog that they got for the kid, Chewbacca, was actually the exact same dog, Brandy, that was beheaded early in the film and that the kid had apparently brought the dog back to life. So as proof, Charlie says... I went to the pet cemetery and dug up Brandy's body and I found a completely different dead dog in the grave. Now, as far as I'm aware, at least according to the synopsis that I read, this is how the book left things with Charlie basically like starting to consider the possibility that maybe Joey was actually who the cult said he was. Maybe not. He's not really sure. And I actually really liked this ambiguity. And it was also kind of framed like that in the first like two acts of the movie. Pretty much everything that happened, and you could tell they were deliberately setting it up like this, pretty much everything that happened could either be attributed, one, to Joey being the Antichrist, like the cult said, or just to like weird coincidences, you know what I mean? Like for example, Grace could have really been psychic with a line to where the kid was going to be at any given time, but then the story explicitly lays out the fact that Charlie's kind of supposed friend was working working for the enemy. He was like a mole and he told the cult members where they were, which would explain how they would always find them. Additionally, like the fact that the wrong dog was in the grave was explained away like by a cemetery caretaker who, you know, Charlie was like, it's the wrong dog. This isn't the dog that's supposed to be in there. And the caretaker like laughs at him and was like, look, nobody cares like which dog ends up in which hole. It's like mix-ups happen all the time. It's a pet cemetery. Nobody really gives much of a crap. So, you know, that could have been explained away like that. And I mean, the bats that killed Grace could have been just like a weird fluke or like mass rabies or some shit like that. And Christine coming back from the dead, supposedly, might also not have been miraculous. I mean, the paramedics had just stopped working on her. She'd only been flatlined for a minute or two. And then Joey kind of like hugged her and said, oh, please come back and blah, blah, blah. And that kind of just caused her to wake up, which that's happened in real life before. So, you know what I mean? It's not like she'd been dead for like a year and then suddenly he like touched her and she came out. So, I mean, she just like died supposedly. So, I mean, everything in other words could have had a completely rational explanation. And I liked that they laid it out like that. And honestly, I feel like that's where the movie should have ended because I found it like a really intriguing idea to have this lingering doubt like in the Charlie character. He had spent all this time protecting this mother and child, even falling in love with Christine along the way, like even considering marrying her. But then a couple inexplicable things occurred, which made him question everything that he had invested so much like time and emotion into. Like had the end of the movie been left open as it presumably was in the book, it would have really been an interesting examination into how a normal person like Charlie could come to believe in outrageous things. You know what I mean? Like how easy it would be to sway someone into bat shittery like once certain suggestions have been planted in their mind. You know what I mean? Now, I will note, at, at least from my reading of the novel synopsis, it was perhaps implied that Joey very well might have been the Antichrist, but I don't think it was ever stated outright, um, which was the whole reason for having every incident kind of feature this aspect of plausible deniability to it because you never knew. But see, no, the movie didn't do that. The movie had to go and very baldly establish that yes, Joey's the Antichrist and he's evil and the servants of Twilight who killed multiple innocent people and at least two dogs over the course of the movie were correct in their beliefs. So at the end of the movie, there's kind of like this coda where Joey and Chewbacca, the dog, come to visit Charlie in the sanitarium or wherever it is that he's staying at. And Joey essentially tells like, Charlie's like, um, I know, like, I know that you're the Antichrist. And the kid's like, yeah, I know. 
You know what I mean? So he's like that. And then, like, later on, he's talking to him, and he tells Charlie that, you know, despite his powers, that's not what he says, but that's, like, the implication. That he's like, well, I still needed a dad, but now you can't be my dad because, you know, he's not down with the evil, right? So the kid basically does the Darth Vader force choke on him and kills the guy, like, right there in the couch in the rec room. So he just, like, kills Charlie at the end. So I had some problems with his ending, as you might imagine. Now, the whole, you know, crazy murderous religious people turn out to be right all along trope, that has been done before, but offhand, I can really only think of one movie where it was done right, and that would be the excellent 2001 film Frailty, which was, you know, directed by the late, great Bill Paxton, which if you haven't seen it, that's a fantastic film. Most other times that this trick is pulled in a movie, it kind of, like, pisses me right off. I mean, I guess because... The filmmakers, what they're essentially doing, they're retroactively justifying the horrific actions of the villains in the service of a cheap twist. Although, to be honest, maybe the filmmakers or the writers or whoever comes up with the story isn't really thinking about the implications all that much. They're just like, ooh, this will be like a twist, you know what I mean? But I don't know. Like, to me, I just, I don't know. I don't like that twist usually. Like I said, Frailty was awesome. It got away with it. But most of the other ones like that don't. And the thing about the film version of The Servants of Twilight is that even though the reveal of Joey as, yeah, he was the Antichrist all along, is played as a twist you could still see it coming a mile away. Even though right up until the end, I kept hoping, I was like, I know that they're gonna make him really be the Antichrist, but I was I was really hoping that they wouldn't go there, they wouldn't do that. I mean, honestly, honestly, I would have even preferred it if the twist had been that Joey was supernatural, but was actually the second coming of Jesus and the cultists got it completely wrong. Like it was like opposite. Like that would have been awesome. Like if they wanted to go that route, because that would have been, cause for a second, I thought that's what they were going to do. Like when she, when he resurrected the mom, I was like, oh, it's going to be like, you know, the, the cult were still the bad guys because they thought, oh, he's the antichrist, but actually he's Jesus. So I was like, that would have been a lot cooler. So I was kind of hoping that they did that, but no, they didn't. And I mean, barring that, like, I don't know. Did you really have to have a twist at all? I, I really think you didn't. I mean, I think I would have preferred that all the events hinting that Joey was evil were left unclear. So you could read the film as Charlie having fallen for the cult's bullshit too. Or if you wanted to believe that Joey was the Antichrist all along and that the cultists were right, then you could also read it that way. I think it was like better to like leave it ambiguous. You know, I don't know. I mean, I suppose I just don't have like much patience with a movie that posits that murderous religious fanatics are correct and like justified in their actions, especially when the book didn't even go there. And I think it would have been like a richer story if they hadn't just definitively come down on one side or the other. I mean, all that said, uh, The Servants of Twilight, the movie, it's still like a serviceable movie. It's still worth watching if you're really into Dean Koontz. Uh, the acting is actually quite good and there are some like really good suspenseful sequences. I will admit though that I kind of wish that the mystery of who Grace was and the, all the specifics of the cult's agenda were drawn out for a little bit longer. I mean, once it was established, and it was pretty early on in the story, that Grace and the servants wanted Joey dead because they believed he was the Antichrist, there wasn't really anywhere else for the narrative to go. Like, you know, the mystery had been solved and the rest of it was just, you know, at, after that, it just kind of became a series of set pieces where the protagonist would move to a new location, the cult would immediately find them, there'd be kind of like a fight and then rinse and repeat, you know what I mean? Like for the rest of the movie. And as I mentioned, like the end, I just found that the end like a tad infuriating as the way the story built up, I was either hoping that Joey's nature would be left inconclusive, which would have been, like I said, made it like a more deep story or more like thing, like more thought provoking, I guess, or that there would be a switcheroo. If you had to have a twist, like there could be a switcheroo and Joey would turn out to be like a messiah or something like that, like, and not the antichrist, like he'd be like a good guy. But vindicating the cult, I mean, that just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. And even from a storytelling standpoint, it just seemed like a really lazy, like obvious gotcha, you know? So I guess I didn't love it from that perspective either. So I still stand by my assertion that Odd Thomas from 2013 is so far the best Koontz adaptation that I've seen. I haven't seen them all, so, you know. Uh, but this one isn't terrible by any means. Uh, it wasn't boring and I didn't have any trouble getting invested in the story. Like I said, you know, the, the acting is good. So the characters, you know, you get invested and you actually kind of care about them. Um, the ending, while annoying, uh, didn't ruin it for me, but I can totally see why this movie 
got mostly negative reviews when it, you know, showed on TV or whatever, and has kind of fallen into relative obscurity since then. So have you seen The Servants of Twilight? What did you think about it? Uh, did you like it? Did you hate it? What is your favorite Dean Koontz adaptation? Please tell me down in the comments. And that will do it for this Flickers of Fear. I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.